Initiative project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome, welcome, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margot, and this is Military Murder, a show where I discuss murders committed by military members and veterans. But you don't have to know anything about the military to enjoy listening. I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. Today, I want to give a very special thanks to one of my listeners, Don B. Don B donated to the Military Murder Morale Fund this week, and she is this week's show producer. Don B, thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. I appreciate it so much. And don't forget, listeners, anyone can donate to the Morale Fund, a.k.a. help produce Military Murder Show, by donating on my website or on PayPal using my email, militarymurderpodcast at gmail.com. On to today's listener-recommended case. Imagine that you are a young college freshman girl. But not just a freshman at any old college, a freshman at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, a premier university. You're in your dorm room having girl talk, and one of your friends seems to have her entire life worked out. She's engaged to the love of her life, another freshman who's a cadet at the U.S. Air Force Academy, which is yet another premier military academy. So you're feeling all types of jealousy because you know what? You've never been in love before. Yet here is this other female cadet and she has the perfect life. Pangs of loose jealousy run through your body. But you know what? Good for her. As the girl talk progresses, you comment on how in love they are. And you wonder out loud if her boyfriend has ever cheated on her. Your friend surprisingly says, yes, he cheated on me once. Well, (laughs) That's not exactly what you expected her to say, so you pry a little bit. So what happened after he said he cheated? She nonchalantly says, I told him to kill the girl, and he did. What? Now your jaw is on the floor. Like, what the what? She's clearly yanking your chain. Or is she? Join me today as I discuss the murder of 16-year-old Adrian Jones and the Texas Cadet Killers. Now, let's dig in. Today's sources include archived documents from CourtTV.com, a news report by Crime Watch Daily, a Dallas Observer article titled Love is a Killer by Elise Pierce, a Texas Monthly article by Skip Hollinsworth titled The Killer Cadets, and an 18-part piece in the Crime Library by Jan Bouchard Kerr. After I wrote the script, I also watched the made-for-TV movie on this case called Swearing Allegiance, directed by Richard Cola. And this movie is available on Amazon Prime Video. Finally, I did read a New Yorker news article by Bill Carter about the timing of the movie and the trials. All right, our story is set in Mansfield, Texas, It is early morning on December 4th, 1995, and a farmer in Grand Prairie, Texas was driving when he saw what he thought was roadkill in a grassy area not too far from Seton Road. As he got closer, he noticed it wasn't roadkill. It was a young girl. She was dead. This young girl would later be identified as 16-year-old Adrian Jessica Jones, who goes by AJ, and she was a sophomore at Mansfield High School. AJ was an all-American girl, blonde hair with light eyes. Some articles describe her eyes as green, while others report that she had a hazel eyes. She was peppy and fun-loving, and she was a good student who studied at least two hours a night. And the icing on the cake, she wasn't only beautiful, she was also athletic. She was on the school's cross-country team after an injury took her out of soccer. And on top of all of this, she also worked a part-time job at the Golden Fried Chicken, which was a fast food joint. Although AJ lived in Mansfield, Texas, her body was discovered in the jurisdiction of Grand Prairie, Texas. So detectives from Grand Prairie were responsible for finding AJ's killer. Detectives Dennis Clay, Dennis Meyer, and Brad Geary. There were no real clues left behind at the murder scene. 
but it was really telling that there were no signs of a struggle at AJ's house and her body did not show signs that she had been bound and forced to this location. Detectives believed that AJ went with her killer voluntarily that night. And another thing, she hadn't been raped, so it didn't appear to be a sexual murder. What was noticeable was that AJ's head, however, was caved in on one side from what appeared to be a blunt force object, and her fingers on one hand had been entirely crushed. The detectives thought maybe her fingers had been crushed when she was trying to block the blows from her head, and she had been executed with two bullets. One entered her left cheek and the other entered her head. Finding the monster that killed AJ was a top priority for this seemingly sleepy town. AJ's mom, Linda, was the last person to see AJ alive. So her story of what happened on the evening of December 3rd, 1995 was crucial. Linda described that that day, which was a Sunday, she had spent all day painting her room. AJ got home from work around 9 p.m. when she had been working at the Golden Fried Chicken. Linda was already in bed when AJ came home and AJ wanted her mom to join her for a late night workout session at the gym. Linda agreed and her and her daughter had one last mommy-daughter workout before AJ was killed. Ugh, and this really just made me so sad. As a girl mom and gym fan who frequently has many dance parties with my own daughters in the kitchen, this made me really, really sad to read. So AJ and her mother, Linda, got their workout in, and as soon as they walked in the door, the phone rang, but it was 10.45 p.m. Who the heck was calling that late? It turned out it was AJ's boyfriend. Linda decided to cut her daughter some slack that night, and she let AJ talk, even though it was past her phone curfew. Linda remembered that while AJ was talking on the phone, she got a call on call waiting, so, you know, when you're beep, when you're on the phone and someone calls, there's like a beep and then you click over. Well, Linda asked AJ who was calling. AJ told her that it was David from Cross Country. Linda told AJ not to stay up too late and then she herself went to bed. The next morning, Linda and the family were getting ready for the day and Linda was looking for AJ, but she wasn't home. Linda believed that maybe AJ went for a run, but then she saw her sneakers. After a while, Linda got really worried and she called the track coach because she had remembered that phone call the night before from David from track team. So Linda calls the track coach and says, hey, can you track down some boy named David from the track team to see if he's heard from AJ? There was actually a boy named David on the track team and the coach tracked him down, asked him if he had spoken to AJ and he said, no, he hadn't. And that was that. Then, later that morning, AJ's body was found and Linda's worst nightmares had been realized. Now, it's important for me to note that AJ's little brother mentioned to detectives that the night prior when she went missing, he noticed a white truck was outside their house idling before it took off. So the detectives made a mental note of this. Immediately upon interviewing AJ's family and close friends, investigators began compiling an extensive list of potential suspects. And at the top of this list were three particular suspects and an additional person that was quickly ruled out. The first real potential suspect to come up in this case was a girl by the name of Monica, not her real name. This girl lived in town in a trailer park and she had recently been involved in an altercation that involved beating someone with a bat and shooting at someone else with a gun. Hmm? Yeah, that sounds like a legit lead, right? And to top it off, AJ was best friends with the girl that Monica had attacked with a bat. Okay, I know that's a lot. Let me explain. About a year before AJ was brutally murdered, Monica, another Mansfield high schooler, was dating a boy. Monica discovered that her boyfriend had cheated on her with one of AJ's friends, a local 14-year-old girl named Kristen C. Monica was enraged, so she set Kristen up for an attack. And when Kristen was getting out of her car, she was ambushed by Monica yielding a baseball bat like a madwoman. Monica beat 14-year-old Kristen to a pulp. Miraculously, Kristen walked away with her life. But beyond the psychological issues resulting from a brutal attack, Kristen suffered a fractured cheekbone, a broken nose, a concussion, and 45 stitches on the back of her head. 
she even had to have reconstructive surgery on her face. It's unclear if it was during this altercation or a separate incident where Monica also shot her boyfriend with a gun Mm -hmm. and he survived. After this, Monica was kicked out of school due to a restraining order. Clearly, no one in their right mind would want Monica around the girl that she almost killed who was also in high school. And the interesting fact for our case today is that AJ was a witness at Monica's trial. AJ was a witness on behalf of her best friend, Kristen C., who had been brutally attacked. And for that attack, Monica received two years probation. So Monica looks like a pretty good lead for AJ's murder. In any event, when questioned about AJ's murder, Monica had an alibi and she agreed to take a polygraph, which she passed with flying colors. So Monica was quickly crossed off the list. Next up, Police next wanted to talk to the two guys AJ was last heard talking to, David from the track team and AJ's boyfriend. First, they started with David. When they questioned him, David from the track team denied knowing anything about AJ's murder, and he even denied talking to her that night. But when they looked into David, he didn't seem like the type of person to be involved in a brutal murder. For starters, he was the cadet commander of the junior ROTC detachment at the high school. He was a senior, and he had recently received notice that he got an appointment to the United States Air Force Academy. They don't just let anyone in, you know? Additionally, on the night in question, he was with his girlfriend, Diane Zamora, and she was also a star student. She was a senior at Crowley High School, and she was equally as impressive as David. She had been accepted to the U.S. Naval Academy, and her and David were engaged to be married. So the detectives thought that they were wasting their time with this kid, and they moved on to the next the next more likely culprit, AJ's boyfriend, a guy by the name of Tracy Smith. Now, Tracy Smith was a hunky guy. He looked like a football player. Well, AJ met him while working at the chicken joint. They had recently began dating because he was from a neighboring town called Venus. And so they didn't go to the same high school. So they met at the chicken joint and they start dating. And as I mentioned earlier, on the evening before the murder, against AJ's mother's will, AJ was allowed to speak to her boyfriend at 10.45 p.m., even though it was past her phone curfew, which is typically 10 p.m. AJ's parents thought that Tracy might have something to do with the disappearance because after AJ was murdered, he didn't even bother to call the house to speak to AJ's parents to offer his condolences. Police interviewed Tracy and he had an alibi. He was home. So he agreed to a polygraph and he also passed with flying colors. Another person crossed off the list. Although Tracy was off the list, he did clue investigators into another possible suspect. While AJ was on the phone with her boyfriend that night, she told him that she got a call through call waiting from someone named Brian. Well, this was interesting because AJ told her mother that she was talking to a boy named David. But then AJ told her boyfriend that she was talking to a boy named Brian. So who was she actually talking to? David had already said it wasn't him, so investigators dig for a guy named Brian. And they find out that AJ does know a 17-year-old boy named Brian, and he frequented her job at the chicken place, partly because he worked nearby. Investigators learn that Brian is overly infatuated with AJ, borderline stalker, and he freaked AJ out so much that whenever he came by, she hid. Police look into David and they find out that he's a loner, he has some mental health issues, and in fact, he's taking four different types of medications to help combat his depression. The detectives bring him in for questioning and at first, Brian's like, AJ? Hmm, let me think. Mm, No, no, that name doesn't ring a bell. Then, Brian admitted that he knew her. When they start asking questions about the night of the murder, Brian gets real squirrely and he remembers being drunk that night. And by the way, Let me just say this. This guy ends up being the worst witness for anyone, including himself. I say this because as the police question him about his whereabouts on the night that AJ left her house and was murdered, he said, hmm, I don't I don't remember what I did. It's I guess it's possible that I went to see AJ like what? I mean, if I were a cop, I'd be all over this guy like white on rice. And they were. You either saw her or you didn't. You either went to her house late at night or you didn't. It's pretty simple. And the detectives ask if he took her anywhere that night. 
And he said, yeah, it's possible. So police are on the prowl, but they let Brian go. But within a week, they show up to his house armed with not only an arrest warrant, but also a search warrant. Oh, and by the way, this kid drives a truck, so detectives are sure they have the right guy. Before this, AJ's murder wasn't even a blimp on the national stage. But after Brian was arrested, the case made headlines. Maybe it was the possibility that someone with mental health issues had been stalking a beautiful high school student. I don't know. But now AJ's name was in the media. And everyone, including detectives, thought they had their guy, Brian. As detectives typically do, they flipped Brian's house upside down, looking for evidence of AJ, looking for evidence of the crime scene, a plot to kill, anything. But the search turned up zip, zero, nothing. Brian's father vigorously argued that it wasn't possible that Brian committed the murder because he had never left the house at night. Well, you know, that's a nice defense. Except, but for AJ being murdered, her parents also thought that AJ was home all night long. 17-year-old Brian was forced to spend Christmas 1995 and New Year's in jail. But after he agreed to a polygraph and the search of his house and truck yielded no evidence linking him to the murder, Brian was finally released from jail. Brian was crossed off the list, especially because he had passed the polygraph. And detectives are back to square one. After the initial stages of investigation, the trail kind of went cold and things slowly began to go back to normal for the teenagers of Manfield High School. But Linda and Bill didn't give up hope that their daughter's killer would be found. Linda visited with psychics grasping at straws, and the rumors in the small town were running rampant. Well, Mansfield High School dedicated a tree in AJ's honor, and life went on per usual. Winter turned into spring, and the seniors went to prom, then they graduated, then summer... Then the seniors became college freshmen and the high school juniors became high school seniors. And as summer was coming to an end, detectives were back in Grand Prairie, racking their brains. Who killed AJ? Then, on August 29th, 1996, they got a call from the United States Naval Academy. It was a Navy judge advocate, a.k.a. a lawyer. And this lawyer was trying to find out if they had any unsolved murders involving a young high school girl. Huh? Well, in fact, we do. Why do you ask? Well, said the person from the Naval Academy, we have a young bleeb, meaning a freshman cadet, who allegedly told her roommates that her boyfriend killed a young high school girl back in Texas. Oh, really? So what's the boyfriend's name? His name is David Graham. He's a freshman cadet at the Air Force Academy. The detective's ears perked up like, what the heck is going on? The detectives quickly got on the next flight out of Texas and headed toward Annapolis. They needed to have a chat with Diane. Diane was enjoying her first Navy football game of the season when she was called into an office and greeted by the detectives. They start peppering her with questions about what she told her girlfriends over girl talk a few days ago. And Diane was shocked. One, that her friends reported her. And two, that the detectives could believe that she would kill anyone or that her boyfriend David, actually her fiance, would kill anyone. No way. Not me. Not him. Deny, deny, deny. Diane admitted that she told the crazy story as a way of acting tough around her friends. That was all. It was evident that detectives were not going to get anything out of Diane. So they packed up their stuff and they left. The Naval Academy was scratching their heads like, what the heck do we do with Diane now? We can't have someone going around bragging about murdering someone in our freshman class. And so they sent Diane packing, temporarily that is, until everything was cleared up. Diane was given a one-way ticket to Texas, but before she went to Texas, she made a pit stop in Colorado to see her fiancé and to warn him about what was to come. It's unclear what David said to Diane after she had to confess to being a blabbermouth so they might actually get busted for murder, 
but I would have been livid. Like, dang girl, can't you keep your mouth shut? But it appeared that David was so head over heels in love with Diane that he told her not to worry about a thing. Diane then left. Because she couldn't stay in Colorado too long, her boyfriend was a freshman at the Air Force Academy after all, and there were rules. Detectives then paid David a visit in Colorado Springs, and they were surprised to find out that Diane already told him that they were coming. At first, David played the same hand as Diane. Deny, deny, deny. Guys, I have no idea why Diane made up such an absurd story. I have no clue. But you see, detectives had something up their sleeve. Those sneaky detectives. You see, it's unclear to me when the detectives gathered the following information, but I'm assuming that it was from the moment that they heard about Diane's girl talk story to when they arrived in Colorado. Detectives found a smoking gun. I mean, not literally, but figuratively. The detectives had interviewed one of David's friends back home who told a terrifying tale. This friend said that on the night of AJ's murder, David and Diane came knocking on his window late at night. They asked to come in and the friend allowed them to enter. They were covered in blood from what the friend thought was a car accident. David asked him not to ask any questions and not to tell a soul. The pair then, Diane and David, then went into the bathroom to clean up. And the friend remembers hearing excessive crying and someone throwing up into the toilet. The friend was too afraid to ask what happened, so he just never said or asked anything. What in the flipping hell? Ugh, why? Why? Why do people not ask questions? Ask questions. I don't want to know. Once detectives told David about this friend, the color drained from David's face as he realized there was no way he could keep hiding the truth. Then David asked for a typewriter so he could write it all down. He went on for four and a half typed pages to describe a parent's worst nightmare. Guys, please, I urge everyone, when you finish this episode, go read the confessions. I will link it on my website. I had heard this story before I sat down to write this episode, but I started my personal research by reading David's confession, and I just about fell out of my chair 1,000 times. This kid is so obnoxious. Skip Hollinsworth said in his Texas Monthly article that, quote, one forensic psychologist would later equate David's confession with a Daniel Steele novel, end quote. But before I tell you what happened to AJ, I have to take you back to the beginning the beginning of David and Diane's romance. Diane and David never went to the same high school, but they met in 1991 when they were 14 years old and both a part of the Civil Air Patrol cadet program. To briefly describe CAP, which is Civil Air Patrol, it's the official civilian auxiliary of the U.S. Air Force. And the cadet program is for 12 to 18 year olds, and it's kind of like a mini ROTC. And fun fact, since I am learning a bunch of fun things as I'm doing my research for these cases, according to the CAP website, 8% of Air Force Academy cadets participated in CAP before entering the academy. So there's that. All right, back to my story. Diane and David were just friends at 14 years old, and they weren't into each other. They began dating in August of 1995 at the start of their senior year. When they began dating, Diane's family said that their obsession with each other was over the top. When they were together, they always had to have a finger or a hand on one another. For example, when they were unable to be hugging or cuddling, one of them would have to have their finger through the belt loop of the other just to keep like one point of contact. Diane's family was deeply religious and they weren't a big fan of their young, touchy-feely romance, but they figured there was nothing that they could do. I mean, after all, David and Diane were good kids. They were always studying and they both had extremely big aspirations. David wanted to be a pilot and Diane wanted to be an astronaut. And it was no surprise to anybody that they both got into military academies. Diane had actually missed the Air Force Academy deadline, which is why she applied to the Naval Academy with the hopes of transferring her commission to the Air Force upon commissioning as an officer. As I stated earlier, Diane was deeply religious. And when she met David, she was a virgin, and she was adamant that she was saving herself for marriage. And well, at first, she was serious. Then, 
In September of 1995, after only a month of dating, David proposed to Diane and she said yes. They even set a date, August 13th, 2000. This wedding would happen after they both graduated from college and the plan was to have a wedding ceremony at the iconic Yusafa Chapel. David sold some of his guns in exchange for an engagement ring. Once they were engaged, Diane let her guard down and she gave into the hole. Why can't we have sex now? We're going to get married anyway. Why wait? Chatter. And Diane lost her virginity to David and he to her. But if Diane's parents thought the pair was clingy before they had sex, they were even more so after they were bonded by losing their virginity to each other. Well, David was a young boy after all, and he had his urges. All right, let's talk about David now. David was on the cross-country team, and so was AJ. As I stated earlier, AJ was a beautiful, small, athletic girl, and any boy would be lucky to have her. And it seemed that AJ and David had locked eyes on a few occasions. Well, on November 4th, during an away track meet, the two got a little too cuddly. And after the track meet, AJ asked David for a ride home. David agreed, but instead of heading home, they took a little detour. And according to David, in not so many words, AJ seduced him and they had sex in the back of his car. AJ, mind you, didn't know that David was engaged and she definitely didn't know that he had a girlfriend. According to David's confession, of the sexcapades, he said it was, quote, short-lived and hardly appreciated, end quote. He further said that it was meaningless and painful, but painful because he was betraying his one true love. David was filled with immense regret after cheating on his number one boo, and he wore that regret all over his stupid little face. At the start of December, Diane couldn't stand that her fiancé didn't seem like himself anymore, and she confronted him. What's up with all this moping, man? He finally cracked and told Diane that he cheated on her with AJ. He swore up and down that it was a one-time thing and it didn't mean anything to him. But Diane flew into a fit of rage and she, no kidding, started screaming like a maniac. She grabbed a large brass object and tried to attack David with it, but he grabbed it from her hands. Then Diane began banging her head on the floor, on the wall, over and over and over again. David was shocked. But in that moment, he understood her fury. He begged her, please, 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 please. I'll do anything. I'll do anything to prove my love for you. Absolutely anything. Diane was screaming over and over and over again until the words, kill her, kill her, kill her, kill her, came flying out of her mouth without regard for life, either AJ's or her own. David said, yes, yes, I will do it. And in David's own words, quote, the only thing that could satisfy her womanly vengeance was the life of the one that had for an instant taken her place, end quote. How could David say no to the one he loved? According to him, quote, Diane's beautiful eyes have always played the strings of my heart effortlessly, end quote. And from that moment on, according to both David and Diane's written confessions, the pair began to plot AJ's demise. The plan was for Diane to hide in the back of the hatchback part of her parents' green Mazda protege, while David called AJ to lure her out of the house and into the car. David would drive AJ to a secluded area, and there he would, quote, break her young neck and sink her to the bottom of the lake with weights, end quote. On December 3rd, the plan was put into action. It just so happened that AJ was talking to her boyfriend when David phoned her. He told her he wasn't feeling good and he wanted to talk, and AJ agreed. AJ had typically snuck out of her bedroom window, but due to being recently busted by her dad for sneaking out of her window, her dad had nailed the windows in her room shut. So on December 4th, at around 12.30 in the morning, AJ quietly slipped out the front door without her parents noticing to meet David. David and AJ drove in mostly silence for about 15 or 20 minutes and they ended up near Joe Pool Lake. There, David pulled over and grabbed AJ trying to break her neck 
when he realized breaking someone's neck wasn't as simple as it was in the movies. David described a panic falling over him as he realized this isn't going to be easy. As he and AJ were struggling in the front seat, David realized that they were in too deep and at this point, it's either AJ or them. Diane then emerged from the hatchback. Remember, in these cars, she was hiding in the trunk, but there was like a little lever where the back seat opened up. And so Diane pulled that lever and she came out. She grabbed one of the weights that they had planned to use to weigh AJ's body down and Diane clobbered AJ over the head over and over again as David held AJ down in the front passenger seat. David described in his confession that he could tell that Diane was, quote, first acting out of passionate rage, but now she was fighting from instinct, end quote. But AJ wasn't going down without a fight. She was a fighter. And while she was getting attacked by two people, she managed somehow to get the window open and pull herself out of the car through the window. Diane and David quickly panicked as they imagined her getting away. But AJ was seriously injured and she must have been dizzy from getting clobbered on the head because she was bleeding. So as she stumbled through the field ahead, she collapsed. David grabbed a 9mm gun that he often carried on his person. Remember guys, this is Texas. And chased after AJ as she lay dying. David admitted that in that very moment, he just wanted to get in the car and leave. But he feared leaving behind a witness. So he pointed and shot AJ twice, ensuring she was dead. After he described shooting AJ, he said, quote, I was very confused and scared. I probably looked like the proverbial headless chicken running around the crime scene, end quote. True Crime Army, when you read this guy's confession, I mean, it's just too much. Anyway, David then jumped in the car and drove off. And then the love of his life, the woman he killed for, no kidding looked at him and said, I love you. He reciprocated. And then Diane said, quote, we shouldn't have done that, David, end quote. Really? To which David retorted, quote, well, nice time to tell me, end quote. Diane's confession differs slightly from David's, and I just want to mention the differences. Diane basically says that AJ came out to meet David thinking that they were going to hook up again. When David pulled over, AJ leaned her seat back and David motioned for Diane to come out of the hatchback. When Diane came out, AJ was freaking out, which is logical. David assured her they just wanted to talk. He was trying to calm AJ down. Diane then confronted AJ and asked her something about why she had had sex with David. And according to Diane, AJ said she didn't even enjoy it because there was too much guilt. At this point, Diane was enraged by the look in AJ's eyes as she told her about the guilt. So Diane began her crazy screaming again and yelled at David to quote, just do it, just do it, just do it, end quote. And that's when David struggled with AJ. And then Diane had to get involved with the weights. Diane recalled while she was hitting AJ with the weights, she knew things had gone too far and she just couldn't stop. Quote, somehow stopping seemed scarier than going on, end quote. Then Diane's story diverges slightly again. Diane said that David followed AJ until she collapsed in the field. Then David returned to the car to leave. But Diane told him, AJ's not dead and you need to shoot her. And that was when he grabbed the gun and shot AJ. Those two parts right there seem very important in Diane's role in the actual murder. In her confession, she not only admitted to egging him on with the, you know, just do it statement at the initiation of the attack, but then she told David to shoot AJ until he knew she was dead. After the murder, they drove straight to one of David's friend's house in Burleson, Texas. And that is where the friend let them in through the window and thought maybe they had been in a car accident. The couple cleaned up in the bathroom, put all their bloody clothes in a bag, threw it in a dumpster on their way to Diane's house. At Diane's house, Diane cleaned out the car alone because David was too freaked out to help. In fact, he wouldn't get in that car for many, many months after that. Now, that car, which Diane was cleaning, 
would soon be used by Diane's father the next morning for school drop-offs. David described Diane was in shock and he was scared. Diane describes the two of them being afraid to even look at each other. And in some ways, she thought they were actually afraid of each other. Okay, so let me just stop right here and let's digest that just a little bit. Can you imagine this feeling like, okay, let's kill for each other. And then you do. But then you're like, oh, I'm sleeping with a murderer. Like, how do I know that they won't try to kill me? Insane. Am I right? Sorry, I just always think of this when I see these cases where two or more people commit a murder together. Like, how do you know that they're not going to turn on you, especially if you're the only surviving witness? Anyway, David described school the next day as surreal. They announced AJ's death over the loudspeaker and the school was somber. Kids were in the hallways and classrooms crying and he felt so much guilt. David even remembers seeing AJ's mother at the grocery store, and he saw AJ's face on the front of the newspapers as he was checking out. Everywhere he turned, it was right there as a reminder of the terrible thing that he had done. David remembered wanting it all to be a dream. He wanted to go back to the night of December 3rd and never pick up AJ. But it wasn't a dream. It was real. AJ was killed on December 4th, 1995, and David and Diane wrote their confessions on September 6th, 1996. After Diane and David confessed, police found the murder weapons, both the weights and the gun, in David's parents' attic. The most shocking part of this story is that the rumor mills about David and Diane being the killers were roaming the high school hallways before David and Diane even graduated, but no one said anything. The two teenagers were charged with murder, but this charge was later elevated to capital murder. And let's just be honest, guys, it's Texas, so they mean business. A death sentence in Texas is a death sentence. But before Diane and David went to trial, AJ's family requested the prosecutors remove the possibility of the death sentence because they thought the murder of their daughter was one young death too many and they didn't want to continue to contribute to the execution of young kids, which is so big of them. Wow, I would be like, where's the switch? Let's fry these guys. So remember that made-for-TV movie about this case I mentioned earlier? Well, that movie was produced and ready to go before the trials of David Graham and Diane Zamora. As reported by The New Yorker, the producers didn't get anyone's permission to make the movie, which they didn't really need to get anyway. They just ripped the story from the headlines, kind of like I do for this podcast, and they made the movie. Well, when David and Diane's lawyers found out about that movie, they were reasonably upset. And AJ's parents were equally upset. The lawyers thought that the movie would taint the jury, inflame passions, all those keywords that lawyers like to use to basically mean my client isn't going to have his or her constitutionally required fair trial if everyone in the state is tainted by this movie. But movie execs fought back, saying that it was very important for the story to be told right now because the movie described a cautionary tale about, quote, teenagers losing perspective about the value of human life when weighed against the power of teenage love, end quote. But the TV station finally said, OK, OK, fine. We won't air the movie in the Fort Worth, Dallas area, but it's airing everywhere else. Diane faced trial first. At Diane's trial, she fought to have her confession thrown out because she said that she was coerced to confess. This girl. She claimed that the investigators promised her that she would be able to see David if she told them what they wanted to hear. Her request was denied and the confession was admitted into evidence anyway. Diane took the stand in her own defense and threw David under the bus. Like, where's the bus? Can I get a bus sound around here? You hear that? David was underneath that bus. Diane said, first off, David was an abusive boyfriend. And also, I didn't know David was going to kill AJ. We only went there to confront her and that was it. Cheer crime army. I've said this before and I'll say it again. So much for their beautiful love, huh? On February 17th, 1998, Diane was convicted of capital murder 
and she received a mandatory life sentence. She will be eligible for parole after she serves 40 years in jail. David was up next, and well, since Diane was already willing to take the stand in her own defense and sing like a canary, the state granted her immunity to testify against David. But in a twist no one expected, right before she had to testify, Diane invoked her Fifth Amendment right to not incriminate herself, and she refused to testify against David. But I imagine that the defense wanted her to testify so that they could prove that she was equally at fault, if not more, than David, thereby lessening the blame on David. After Diane's great disappointment for the defense, the defense had nothing, and they rested without calling a single witness. And on July 24, 1998, David was convicted of capital murder and automatically sentenced to life with the possibility of parole after serving 40 years in prison. Now, Crime Watch Daily got an exclusive jailhouse interview with Diane over a decade after her conviction. In that interview, Diane said that the night of the murder is now a blur, which is understandable because it's been a decade, or it was a decade when she did the interview. But she knows that she's not a cold-blooded killer, she said. She said that although she wished AJ dead, she didn't think that it could actually happen. And Diane denied ever physically hurting AJ. She said the extent of her involvement was only pulling AJ's hair. In fact, she takes it a little step further and says the motive for the murder was not love at all, but it was an excuse for David to know what it was like to use his gun on a person. All right, there is so much information out there about this case, including books and true crime documentaries. So if you want more on this case, there are plenty of resources. Before I wrapped up my research, I found something interesting about David and Diane. According to an 18-part series that I read in this case, I found that David and Diane had documented critical moments in their planners. In Diane's planner, she circled the date that David cheated on her, the date that David told her that he cheated on her, and the date that AJ was killed. Next to December 4th, 1995, she wrote, quote, 1.38 a.m., Adrian, end quote. A forensic psychologist, Sherry Julian, told the Houston Chronicle that David and Diane were exhibiting, quote, what is known as a folly adieu, folly adieu, something like that, a shared pathological disorder. You've got two people who individually would probably never do anything like this but they become so intertwined with one another that they form a third person. They're bright, intellectual people who both probably perceive of themselves as highly moral. But then they come together. And somehow, out there in the cosmos, these two celestial bodies collide, and this is what they produce. End quote. For me, this case is especially scary because... But for Diane's inability to keep her mouth shut, this couple would have gotten away with this murder and they probably would have commissioned as military officers. That scares the crap out of me. By the way, the girls who ratted Diane out did the right thing. I didn't want to get too bogged down with the facts in this case when Diane was the Naval Academy, but I do want to point out that before Diane confessed to her girlfriends, she had actually made a similar statement to a male Navy cadet earlier in the summer, but he really didn't believe her, so he never reported it. That male cadet was later kicked out of the academy for failure to follow the honor code. Crazy, right? All right, let's keep the conversation going on social media. You can find me at Military Murder Podcast on Instagram or on Facebook at Military True Crime. And I'm also on Twitter at Military Murder. To my true crime army, thanks for listening and let's make sure that you keep sharing the show on social media. People love personal recommendations, so recommend the podcast to everyone, especially your friends who love true crime. And don't forget to rate and review the show on your favorite podcast app. This show was created by Mama Margot Productions. All of the music was created by Ty Ops, and this week's special producer is Don B. Thank you so much, Don B, for supporting the show by donating to the Morale Fund. Everyone, be sure to check out the show notes for a direct link to my sources page. 
Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of. So remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. Shh, let's work another podcast.